हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर रविंद्र कुमार पाठक असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर इन लॉ एट नेशनल यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ स्टडी एंड रिसर्च इन लॉ रांची टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट द रेट्रीब्यूटिव एंड डेटरेंट थियरीज ऑफ पनिशमेंट फर्स्ट वी विल लुक एट द लर्निंग आउटकम्स विच आर नेमली टू अंडरस्टैंड द बेसिक्स ऑफ रेट्रीब्यूटिव थियरी टू एक्सप्लोर द मीनिंग ऑफ लेक्स टेली ऑनिस to understand what is deterrent theory to explore the concept and content of just desert to appreciate the relevance of the theories that we discuss under the rubric of punishment first we come to the introduction some of the fundamental questions about punishment continue to occupy the minds of philosophers and legal scholars who have over the years in their effort to resolve these questions led to the development of different theories of punishment broadly speaking uh, these theories can be categorized as backward looking and uh, forward looking now whereas retributive theory falls within the backward looking category on the other side of the spectrum are those who drawing upon Caesar Beccaria and Jeremy Bentham offer utilitarian justifications for criminal punishment deterrence rehabilitation incapacitation and they are thus supportive of theories that fall in the second category the present write up and module focuses upon two theories retributive theory and deterrent theory now we'll try to see and discuss the contents and contours of contributive retributive theory retribution is a word with a long history in moral philosophy where its connotations are desert proportionality justice rational inquiry now according to sutherland at least since the formulation of hamburavi's court in about 1875 bc of an eye for eye and a tooth for tooth it has been urged by the leaders and accepted by the general public that criminal deserves to suffer the suffering imposed by the state in its corporate capacity is considered the political counterpart of individual revenge it is argued by uh, those supportive of retributive theory that unless the criminal gets the punishment he deserves one or both of the following effects will be produced namely the victim will seek revenge which may mean lynch law if his friends cooperate with him or the victim will refuse to make complaint or offer testimony and the state will be handicapped in dealings with criminals now historically the principle of lex talionis that is an eye for eye and a tooth for tooth entered the western thought through mosaic legal tradition and was applicable to both intentional and unintentional inquiries it served two main purposes namely an endorsement of measured retaliation and an attempt to do equity between the offender and the victim however the principle of lex talionis came to be used as a justification for the cruelest and the most disproportionate of punishment particularly in the middle ages as not an observes outlining the main regions while retaliation was measured by this rule that is lex like talionis it was early uh, it was early perceived that it would not necessarily be equal to the offense one qualification added to the apparent uh, certainty of the rule was founded upon the difference in social station between the parties the eye of a serf did not seem to the equal to the eye of a lord also there are all there are no equivalent reactions to theft blasphemy slander ra rape or the many forms of fraudulent crimes moreover there were many such inner contradictions if we put quote and quote that were inherent in the principle of lex talionis and retributism 
that led to criticisms and debates as to the philosophical uh, justness of the principle. For instance, Beccaria rejected the uh, retributive theory and the principle of Lex Talionis. The prime objective of punishment in Beccaria's day was retribution or revenge. He expressed his rejection in these words that the purpose of punishment is none other than to prevent the criminal from doing fresh harm to fellow citizen and to deter others from doing the same. Therefore, punishments and the method of inflicting them must be chosen such that in keeping with the proportionality, they will make the most efficacious and lasting impression on the minds of man with least torment to the body of the condemned." Unquote. However, those supportive of retributive theory argue that the principle of Lex Talionis need not be applied in its exactitude or in literal sense. Any literal application of the principle has been rejected in categorical term by Kant himself. The retributive idea implores uh, for some kind of proportionality between crime and punishment and it disregards all punishments uh, which are disproportionate in every sense. Retributive theory and the principle of Lex Talionis found support uh, in the writings of Hegel and Kant, two philosophers who have made rich contributions to the understanding of retributive theory. According to Kant, Lex Talionis is the only principle in regulating a public court as distinguished from mere private judgment can definitely assign both the quality and the quantity of a just penalty." Unquote. Now, we will see in detail what Kant, Immanuel Kant talks about punishment and retribution. Kant described right to impose criminal punishment as the right of the sovereign, as the supreme power to inflict pain upon a subject on account of a crime committed by him." Unquote. Kant, who believed penal law to be categorical imperative, said that the punishment must in all cases be imposed only because the individual on, on whom it is inflicted has committed a crime. According to Kant, just punishment is retribution. Retribution is justified because the criminal law is a moral imperative, the violation of which demands retribution. For instance, according to Kant, if a person has committed murder, he must die. The reason being, there is no substitute that will satisfy the requirement of legal justice. There is no sameness of kind between death and remaining alive even under the most miserable conditions and consequently there is no equality between the crime and retribution unless the criminal is judicially condemned and put to death. However, Kant did maintain that the death of the criminal must be kept entirely free of any maltreatment that would make an abomination of humanity residing in the person suffering it. It is rightly observed that Kant did not develop a theory of punishment of his own in any systematic fashion. He makes it plain that he prefers a retributive account one that would make the person's punishment depend on his own deserts rather than on the penalties societal benefits. Some passages give the initial impression of a starkly retributive theory of punishment where only the offender's demerit and no social utility can be considered for any purpose. A closer look however suggests this is not necessarily so. Kant in his famous and oft quoted observation said, quote, juridical punishment can never be administered merely as a means 
for promoting another good either with regard to the criminal himself or to the civil society, but must in all cases be imposed only because the individual on whom it is inflicted has committed a crime. For one man ought not to be dealt with merely as a means subservient to the purpose of another. Against such treatment, his inborn personality has a right to protect him, even though he may be condemned to lose his civil personality. He must first be found guilty and punishable before, he, before there can be any thought of drawing from his punishment any benefit for himself or for the fellow citizens." Unquote. In another observation, he asserts, and I quote, but what is the mode and measure of punishment which public justice takes at, as its principle and standard? Is it just the principle of equality by which the pointer of the scale of justice is made to incline no more to the one side than the other? It may be rendered by saying that the undeserved evil which anyone commits on another is to be regarded as perpetrated on himself. Hence, it may be said that if you slander another, you slander yourself. If you steal from another, you steal from yourself. If you strike another, you strike yourself. If you kill another, you kill yourself. This is the right of retaliation, just talionis, and properly understood, it is the only principle which in regulating a public court as distinguished from mere private judgment can definitely assign both the quality and the quantity of a just penalty. All other standards are wavering and uncertain and on account of other considerations involved in them, they contain no principle conformable to the sentence of pure and strict justice. George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel agrees with the Kantian thesis that the punishment equals retribution. However, unlike Kant, he gives a metaphysical justification for retribution. According to Hegel, a crime is an infringement of rights. This infringement is erased by the infringement caused by the infliction of punishment of the rights of the criminal and in particular of his right to freedom. Hegel's version of retribus retributism vis-a-vis -vis Kantian version may be seen thus. The general attraction of Hegel's version of retributivism is that the punishment in his theory is thought to endorse are commensurable in value with precipitating crimes in contrast to the strict equivalence required by Kant's theory of punishment. As a result, Hegel's theory is praised both for being more acceptable to modern readers than Kant's so-called pure retributivism, as well as for being an emphatically anti-utilitarian theory. Now, to conclude the discussion on retributive theory, it can be said, quoting Jeffrey Murphy, that the retributivist seeks not primarily for the socially useful punishment, but for the just punishment, the punishment that the criminal given his wrongdoing deserves or merits, the punishment that the society has a right to inflict and the criminal a right to demand. Retributivism justifies punishment in terms not of its contingently beneficial effects, but of its intrinsic justice as a response to crime. The justificatory relationship holds between the present punishment and the past crime, not between present punishment and future effects. 
Now we will try to see and discuss about the principle of just asserts. In recent times, the discourse of penal philosophy in criminal law seems to be undergoing a paradigm shift. Doctrine of proportionality has gained much acceptance vis-a-vis -vis utilitarian tradition and Kantian retributive tradition. Now, if we try to decipher the factors that have led to its growing acceptance, one factor that prominently emerges is the notion of justice that the principle seems to serve. To put it otherwise, it aids many, as many argue an element of fairness to punishments meted out. Doctrine of personality has however been beset with few scathing questions namely what does the principle of proportionality require? Does the principle yield only broad outer bounds of punishment? If so, it is rather easily satisfied by avoiding extremes of severity or leniency. Could the principle yield definite quanta of punishment and if so, how could those quanta possibly be ascertained? As regard the juristic and judicial writings on the issue, we come across ample literature that helps us to understand the content and the contour of the principle of just desert. In Lehna versus the state of Haryana, the Supreme Court observed, quote, I quote, uh, the principle of proportion between crime and punishment uh, is a principle of just desert that serves as the foundation of every criminal sentence that is justifiable. As a principle of criminal justice, it is hardly less familiar or less important than the principle uh, that the only guilty ought to be punished. Indeed, the requirement that the punishment not be disproportional, disproportionately great, which is a corollary of just desert, is dictated by the same principle that allows, that does not allow punishment of the innocent. For any punishment in excess of what is deserved uh, for the criminal conduct, is punishment without fault. Now, Justice Chinappa Reddy in the celebrated case of Bishnu Dev Sao versus the state of West Bengal observed that uh, the retributive theory is incongruous in an era of enlightenment. Um, it is inadequate as a theory since it does not attempt to justify punishment by any beneficial results either to the society or to the persons, persons punished. Now, Justice Krishna here also expressed his disapproval of the retributive theory in the famous case of Rajinder Prasad. He said that punishment is not lex talionis of retributive genre. Uh, to be strictly retributive, the same types of cruel killing must be imposed on the killer. Secondly, can the hanging of the murderer bring the murdered back to life? The dull cold ear of death cannot hear the cries or see the tears of the dying convict. In Ram Narayan versus state of Uttar Pradesh, the Supreme Court observed that the broad object of punishment of an accused found guilty in progressive civilized societies is to impress on the guilty party that commission of crimes uh, does not pay and it is both against individual interest and also against the larger interest of society to which he belongs. Thus intents to be appropriate should therefore be neither too harsh nor too lenient. In Bablu versus the state of Rajasthan, Supreme Court reiterated that as a principle of criminal justice, it is hardly less familiar or less important that the principle that only the guilty ought to be punished. Indeed, the requirement that the punishment not be disproportionately great, which is a corollary of just desert, is dictated by the same principle that does not allow punishment of the innocent. For any punishment in excess of what is deserved for the criminal conduct is punishment without guilt. Now, we will try to 
go into detail of Detrin theory. Now, according to this theory, the purpose behind punishment should be to deter the prospective criminals an offender is punished to be set as an example, so that the prospective offenders may see the consequences that they may have to face. In other words, deterrence is the use of punishment to prevent the offender from repeating uh, his offense and to demonstrate to other potential offenders what will happen to them if they follow the wrongdoer's example. Now, it is notable that the deterrence is used in two senses. First, punishment of an offender will deter others from committing the crime for which he or she was convicted. Second, it will deter the person found guilty of an offense from committing further crimes. Now, uh, Bernard J said to a prisoner, thou art to be hanged not for having stolen a horse, but in order that other horses may not be stolen. Now, Vicaria famously said and I quote that the purpose of uh, punishment is none other than to prevent the criminal from doing fresh harm to fellow citizens and to deter others from doing the same. Therefore, uh, punishment and the method of inflicting them must be chosen such that in keeping with the proportionality they will make most efficacious and lasting impression on the minds of man with the least torment to the body of the condemned. Now, according to Norton and I quote what he said, the purpose of punishment being something other than total retaliation, Vicaria concerned himself with the limits and consistency of punishment. The amount of punishment he felt should be defined by the legislature and the courts left without discretion. Further, the legislature should determine this according to two factors. First, the destructiveness of the crime to public safety and happiness and the inherent uh, inducements present in the crime." Unquote. Now, be that as it may, the deterrent theory has been criticized for many reasons. One of the prominent one can be described in these words. A very potent and tangible example of the failure of punishment as deterrent to crime is the fact that in countries where capital punishment has been abolished, there has not been an increase in crime meriting such punishment nor have a many of these abolitionist states reenacted that practice. And also the fact that so large an amount of recidivism is in existence everywhere. And if capital punishment has failed to act as a deterrent, what punishment will? Now, Justice Hansaria, in a case relating to dowry death, expressed similar concern as to the deterrent effect of death sentence. Now, he observed that uh, we, have, we have given considered thought to the question and we have not been able to place the case in that category, which could be regarded as the rarest of the rare type. The increasing number of dowry deaths would be uh, this. To hold the rising graph, we at one point thought to maintain the sentence but we entertain no doubt, we entertain doubt about the deterrent effect of a death penalty. We therefore resist ourselves from upholding the death sentence, much though we would have desired annihilation of a despicable character like the appellant before us." Unquote. Now, Justice Holmes was also very critical of the theory when he said that the theory was immoral in as much as it gives no measure of punishment except lawgivers subjective opinion. Now, despite such criticism, deterrence as an aim of punishment has not been eliminated uh, from the 
policies of modern government, though it has lost much of its former importance. Now, Supreme Court in the state of Karnataka versus Saranappa Basanagoda, Agregora, pertinently observed that the sentence imposed by the courts should have different effect on potential wrongdoers and it should commensurate with the seriousness of the offence. Now, of course, the courts are given discretion uh, in the matter of uh, sentence to take a stock of the wide and varying range of facts that might be relevant for fixing the quantum of sentence, but the discretion shall be exercised with due regard to larger interest of the society and it is needless to aid that the passing of sentence on the offender is probably the most public phase of criminal justice system. The courts have time and again reminded of the need to have punishments having a uh, deterrent effect especially in uh, certain specific categories of offences. For instance, in a case uh, relating to section 364A, the Supreme Court observed that in cases relating to kidnapping for ransom, crime called for deterrent punishment irrespective of the fact that the kidnapping uh, had not resulted in the death of the victim. Now, considering the alarming rise in the case of kidnapping by young children for ransom, the legislature in its uh, wisdom provided for a stringent sentence. Now, the court further added that uh, whoever kidnaps or abducts uh, um, young children for ransom, no leniency be shown in awarding sentence. On the other hand, it must be dealt with in the harshest possible manner and an obligation rests on the courts as well. Now, protection of society and deterring the criminal uh, is the avowed object of law and that is required to be achieved uh, by imposing an appropriate sentence. The sentencing courts are expected to consider all relevant facts and circumstances uh, bearing on the question of sentence and proceed to impose a sentence commensurate with the gravity of the offence. Now, uh, we will try to see the social dimension of deterrence theory. Now, according to deterrence theory, people are punished with a view to conveying a message to the others in the society that it is wrong to behave in a certain in certain ways and if a person behaves in one of the ways and fails to obey the law society will punish him or her according accordingly the expression of society's disapprobation is punishment the conveying the message it is believed creates conscious and unconscious inhibitions against committing crime. In the long run, it leads to a situation where one observes a habitual obedience at large to the laws that prescribe certain acts by way of meeting out punishment. However, it has been argued by many that it is debatable how far punishment acts as a deterrence among the people in any given society. For example, in Sasi Nair versus Union of India, now one of the arguments put forth challenging death penalty on the ground of uh, being violative of Article 21 of the Constitution of India was that capital punishment does not serve any societal purpose and in the absence of any study, the barbaric penalty of death uh, should not be awarded to any person as it has no different effect. Now, it has been argued that the ever growing number of cases despite stringent penal provisions is indicative of failure of the deterrence theory. In short, it may be said that the deterrence theory is immoral because it treats, because it treats individual as means rather than as ends. 
Now additionally, the theory relies on mass obedience. This reliance is contrary to the historical flow of civilization and democracy, which has been moving away from a strong central governments, coercive force and tyranny. Now, Detrain's theory's reliance on mass obedience, therefore, is a serious political threat to the citizenry of any free nation in which Detrain's theorist influence the decision making process. However, uh, the Supreme Court in Maruram sounded apprehensive and justified Detrain theory when it observed that in the uh, present distressed and disturbed atmosphere, if deterrent punishment is not resorted to, there would be complete chaos in the country and criminals will be let loose in endangering the lives of thousands of innocent people of our country. Now, in spite of all the resources at its commands, it, it will be difficult for the state to protect or guarantee the life and liberty of all the citizens uh, if criminals are let loose and deterrent punishment is uh, either abolished or mitigated. Now, secondly, uh, while reformation of the criminal is, 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 is only one side of picture, rehabilitation of the victim and uh, granting relief from the tortures and suffering which are caused to them as a result of the offenses committed by the criminals is a factor which seems to have been completely overlooked uh, while defending the cause of the criminals for abolishing deterrent sentences. Now, there are, there are thus rival opinions as the need and efficacy of deterrent theory. Now, it has been rightly observed that the aims of punishment are now considered to be retribution, just, retribution justice, deterrence, reformation and protection and modern sentencing policy reflects a combination of uh, several or all of these aims. The main aim of punishment uh, in judicial thought, however, is still the protection of society and, and the other objects frequently receive only secondary uh, consideration uh, when sentences are being decided. Now, we will try to look at the judicial approach in India as regards uh, these two theories of punishment. A uh, series of cases on punishment decided by the Supreme Court clearly indicate that the judicial approach in India by and large has been towards reformation and protection of the rights of the people punished. Now, Justice Sagir Ahmed in T. K. Gopal versus Union of Karnataka, uh, State of Karnataka observed that a criminal should be punished and the punishment prescribed must be meted out to him, but also reforms the criminal through various processes that the most fundamental of which is that in spite of having committed a crime, maybe a heinous crime, he should be treated as a human being entitled to all the basic human rights, human dignity and human sympathy. Now, it was under this theory that this court in a stream of decisions uh, projected the need for prison reforms, the need to acknowledge uh, the vital fact that the prisoner after being lost in uh, jail does not lose his fundamental rights or basic uh, human rights, that he must be treated with compassion and sympathy and this uh, unquote. Now, there is no denying the fact that the award of punishment commensurate with the gravity of the offense. Now, as the Supreme Court observed in the state of uh, AMR versus Balram and such an op approach is necessary to ensure that a civilized society does not revert to the days of an eye for eye and tooth for tooth. Not awarding a just punishment uh, might provoke the victim or its uh, relatives to retaliate in kind and that is what exactly is sought to be prevented 
uh, by the criminal justice system we have developed and we have adopted. Now, this philosophy is woven into our statute and our jurisprudence and it is the duty of those who administer the law to bear this in mind, the court reminded in the case. Now, Supreme Court has on a number of occasions indicated that, that the punishment must fit the crime and that it is the duty of the court to impose a proper punishment uh, depending on the degree of criminality and desirability for imposing such punishment. Now, however, uh, amid the chorus of reformative uh, approach, there are certain instances where the Supreme Court has emphasized deterrence. For example, in a state of MP versus Munna Chaube, Supreme Court observed that uh, imposition of sentence uh, without considering its effects on the social order in many cases may be in reality a futile exercise. The social impact of the crime, for example, where it relates to offenses against women, dacoity, kidnapping, uh, misappropriation of public money, treason and uh, other offenses involving moral turpitude or moral de delinquency which have great impact on social order and public interest cannot be lost sight of and per se require exemplary treatment. Any liberal attitude court said by imposing meager sentences or taking too sympathetic view merely on account of lapse of time in respect of such offenses will be result wise counterproductive in the long run and again societal interest which needs to be cared for and strengthened by a string of deterrence inbuilt in the sentencing system. Now, be that as it may, Justice Fazal Ali in Maruram raised one pertinent question that needs to be pondered upon. The question he raised was, should the country take risk of innocent lives being lost at the hands of criminals committing heinous crimes in the holy hope or wishful thinking that one day or the other a criminal however dangerous or callous he may be will reform himself. Balmikis are not born every day and to expect that our present generation with the prevailing social and economic environment uh, would produce Balmikis day after day is to hope for the impossible. Now with this we come to the end of this module. Thank you so much for watching the video.